paints Scotland greeting our her thristle. Her muchkin stoop as tunes a whistle. And D and D excisemen in a bustle. Seizing Estelle. Triumphant crushant like a mussel. Or lampet shell. Burns. During the period of Mr. Bertram's active magistracy, he did not forget the affairs of the revenue. Smuggling, for which the Isle of Man then afforded peculiar facilities, was general, or rather universal, all along the southwestern coast of Scotland. Almost all the common people were engaged in these practices, the gentry connived at them, and the officers of the revenue were frequently discountenanced in the exercise of their duty, by those who should have protected them. There was, at this period, employed as a writing officer, or supervisor, in that part of the country, a certain Francis Kennedy, already named in our narrative, a stout, resolute, and active man, who had made seizures to a great amount, and was proportionally hated by those who had an interest in the fair trade, as they called the pursuit of these contraband adventurers. This person was natural son to a gentleman of good family, owing to which circumstance, and to his being of a jolly convivial disposition, and singing a good song, he was admitted to the occasional society of the gentlemen of the country, and was a member of several of their clubs for practicing athletic games, at which he was particularly expert. At Elangowan, Kennedy was a frequent and always an acceptable guest. His vivacity relieved Mr. Bertram of the trouble of thought, and the labor which had cost him to support a detailed communication of ideas, while the daring and dangerous exploits which he had undertaken in the discharge of his office formed excellent conversation. To all these revenue adventures did the Laird of Elangowan seriously incline, and the amusement which he derived from Kennedy's society formed an excellent reason for countenancing and assisting the narrator in the execution of his invidious and hazardous duty. Frank Kennedy, he said, was a gentleman, though on the rang side of the blanket he was connected with the family of Elangowan through the house of Glengubbel. The last laird of Glengubbel would have brought the estate into the Elangowan line, but happening to go to Harrogate, he there met with Miss Jean Hathaway, by the by, the Green Dragon at Harrogate is the best house of the TWA, but for Frank Kennedy, he's in one sense a gentleman born, and it's a shame not to support him against these blackguard smugglers. After this league had taken place between judgment and execution, it chanced that Captain Dirk Hatterake had landed a cargo of spirits and other contraband goods upon the beach not far from Elangowan, and, confiding in the indifference with which the laird had formerly regarded similar infractions of the law, he was neither very anxious to conceal nor to expedite the transaction. The consequence was that Mr. Frank Kennedy, armed with a warrant from Elangowan and supported by some of the laird's people who knew the country, and by a party of military, poured down upon the kegs, baits, and bags, and after a desperate affray, in which severe wounds were given and received, succeeded in clapping the broad arrow upon the articles and bearing them off in triumph to the next custom house. Dirk Hatterake vowed, in Dutch, German, and English, a deep and full revenge, both against the gauger and his abettors, and all who knew him thought it likely he would keep his word. A few days after the departure of the gypsy tribe, Mr. Bertram asked his lady one morning at breakfast whether this was not little Harry's birthday? Five years old exactly, this blessed day, answered the lady, so we may look into the English gentleman's paper. Mr. Bertram liked to show his authority in trifles. No, my dear, not till tomorrow. The last time I was at quarter sessions, the sheriff told us, that dies, that dies in septus, in short, you don't understand Latin, but it means that a term day is not begun till it's ended. That sounds like nonsense, my dear. Maybe so, my dear, but it may be very good law for all that. I am sure, speaking of term days, I wish, as Frank Kennedy says, that Whit Sunday would kill Martinmas and be hanged for the murder, for there I have got a letter about that interest of Jenny Gernses, and deal a tenant's been at the place yet why a bottle, asterisk a small copper coin, of rent, nor will not till Candlemas, but, speaking of Frank Kennedy, I dare say he'll be here the day, for he was away round to Wigton to warn a king's ship that's lying in the bay about Dirk Hatterake's lugger being on. 
the coast again, and he'll be back this day, so we'll have a bottle of claret, and drink little Harry's health. I wish, replied the lady, Frank Kennedy would let Dirk Hatterake Elaine. What needs he make himself mere busy than other folk? Cannot he sing his sang, and take his drink, and draw his salary, like collector snail, honest man, that never fashes, asterisk troubles, anybody? And I wonder at you, Laird, for meddling and making, did we ever want to send for tea or brandy fray the borough town, when Dirk Hatterake used to come quietly into the bay? Mrs. Bertram, you know nothing of these matters. Do you think it becomes a magistrate to let his own house be made a receptacle for smuggled goods? Frank Kennedy will show you the penalties in the act, and you ken yourself they used to put their run goods into the old place of Elango and up by there. Oh, dear, Mr. Bertram, and what the war were the was in the vault of the old castle for having a wind kegs o' brandy in them at an hour time? I am sure you were not obliged to ken anything about it, and what the war was the king that the lairds here got a soup o' drink, and the ladies their drap o' tea at a reasonable rate, it's a shame to them to pit such taxes on them, and was na I much the better of these Flanders head and pinners, asterisk a headdress with lappets, that Dirk Hatterake sent me of the way from Antwerp? It will be Lang or the king sends me an anything, or Frank Kennedy either. And then you would quarrel with these gypsies too. I expect every day they hear the barnyards in a low. Asterisk a flame. I tell you once more, my dear, you don't understand these things, and there's Frank Kennedy, coming galloping up the avenue. A wheel. A wheel. Elangoan, said the lady, raising her voice as the laird left the room, I wish she may understand them yourself, that's a. From this nuptial dialogue the laird joyfully escaped to meet his faithful friend, Mr. Kennedy who arrived in high spirits. For the love of life, Elangoan, he said, get up to the castle. You'll see that old fox Dirk Hatterick and his majesty's hounds in full cry after him. So saying, he flung his horse's bridle to a boy, and ran up the ascent to the old castle, followed by the laird, and indeed by several others of the family, alarmed by the sound of guns from the sea, now distinctly heard. On gaining that part of the ruins which commanded the most extensive outlook, they saw a lugger, with all her canvas crowded, standing across the bay, closely pursued by a sloop of war, that kept firing upon the chase from her bows, which the lugger returned with her stern chasers. There but at long bowls yet, cried Kennedy, in great exultation, but they will be closer by and by to DN him, he's starting his cargo. I see the good Nance pitching overboard, keg after keg, that's a dd ungenteel thing of Mr. Hatterick, as I shall let him know by and by, now, now. They've got the wind of him, that's it, that's it, hark to him, hark to him. Now, my dogs. Now, my dogs, hark to Ranger, hark. I think, said the old gardener to one of the maids, the gaugers fi, by which word the common people express those violent spirits which they think a presage of death. Meantime the chase continued. The lugger, being piloted with great ability, and using every nautical shift to make her escape, had now reached, and was about to double, the headland which formed the extreme point of land on the left side of the bay, when a ball having hit the yard in the slings, the mainsail fell upon the deck. The consequence of this accident appeared inevitable, but could not be seen by the spectators, for the vessel, which had just doubled the headland, lost steerage, and fell out of their sight behind the promontory. The sloop of war crowded all sail to pursue, but she had stood too close upon the cape, so that they were obliged to wear the vessel for fear of going ashore, and to make a large tack back into the bay, in order to recover sea room enough to double the headland. They'll lose her, by, cargo and lugger, one or both, said Kennedy, I must gallop away to the point of Warwick, this was the headland so often mentioned, and make them a signal where she is drifted to on the other side. Goodbye for an hour, Elangoan, get out the gallon punch bowl and plenty of lemons. I'll stand for the French article by the time I come back, and we'll drink the young laird's health in a bowl that would swim the collector's yawl. So saying, he mounted his horse, and galloped off.
About a mile from the house, and upon the verge of the woods, which, as we have said, covered a promontory terminating in the cape called the Point of Warwick, Kennedy met young Harry Bertram, attended by his tutor, Dominey Sampson. He had often promised the child a ride upon his galloway, and, from singing, dancing, and playing punch for his amusement, was a particular favorite. He no sooner came scampering up the path than the boy loudly claimed his promise, and Kennedy, who saw no risk in indulging him, and wished to tease the dominie, in whose visage he read a remonstrance, caught up Harry from the ground, placed him before him, and continued his route, Samson's peradventure, Master Kennedy being lost in the clatter of his horse's feet. The pedagogue hesitated a moment whether he should go after them, but Kennedy being a person in full confidence of the family, and with whom he himself had no delight in associating, being that he was addicted unto profane and scurrilous jests, he continued his own walk at his own pace, till he reached the place of Elangoan. The spectators from the ruined walls of the castle were still watching the sloop of war, which at length, but not without the loss of considerable time, recovered serum enough to weather the point of Warwick, and was lost to their sight behind that wooded promontory. Some time afterwards the discharges of several cannon were heard at a distance, and, after an interval, a still louder explosion, as of a vessel blown up, and a cloud of smoke rose above the trees, and mingled with the blue sky. All then separated on their different occasions, auguring variously upon the fate of the smuggler, but the majority insisting that her capture was inevitable, if she had not already gone to the bottom. It is near our dinner time, my dear, said Mrs. Bertram to her husband, will it be lang before Mr. Kennedy comes back? I expect him every moment, my dear, said the laird, perhaps he is bringing some of the officers of the sloop with him. My stars, Mr. Bertram. Why did not you tell me this before, that we might have had the large round table, and then, the retired o sought meat, and, to tell you the plain truth, a rump of beef is the best part of your dinner, and that I wad have put on another gown, and you wadna have been the waro wa clean neckcloth yourself, but you delight in surprising and hurrying one, I am sure I am not a hot out forever against this sort of going on, but when folks missed, then they are moaned. Shaw, Shaw. Deuce take the beef, and the gown, and table, and the neckcloth, we shall dole very well that, where's the dominie? John, to a servant who was busy about the table, where's the Dominie and little Harry? Mr. Sampson's been at hame these TWA hours in mare, but I dinna think Mr. Harry came hame why him. Not come hame why him, said the lady, desire Mr. Sampson to step this way directly. Mr. Sampson, said she, upon his entrance, is it not the most extraordinary tiring in this world wide, that you, that have free up putting bed, board, and washing, and twelve pounds sterling a year, just to look after that boy, should let him out of your sight for TWA or three hours? Samson made a bow of humble acknowledgment at each pause which the angry lady made in her enumeration of the advantages of his situation, in order to give more weight to her remonstrance, and then, in words which we will not do him the injustice to imitate, told how Mr. Francis Kennedy had assumed spontaneously the charge of Master Harry, in despite of his remonstrances in the contrary. I am very little obliged to Mr. Francis Kennedy for his pains, said the lady peevishly, suppose he lets the boy drop from his horse, and lames him? Or suppose one of the cannons comes ashore and kills him, or suppose? Or suppose, my dear, said Elangoan, what is much more likely than anything else, that they have gone aboard the sloop or the prize, and are to come round the point with the tide? And then they may be drowned, said the lady. Verily, said Samson, I thought Emmer Kennedy had returned an hour since, of a surety I deemed I heard his horse's feet. That, said John, with a broad grin, was Grizzle chasing the humble cow, a cow without horns, out of the clothes. Samson colored up to the eyes, not at the implied taunt, which he would never have discovered, or resented if he had, but at some idea which crossed his own mind. I have been in an error, he said, of a surety I should have tarried for the babe. So saying, he snatched his bone-headed cane and hat, and hurried away towards Warwickwood, 
faster than he was ever known to walk before or after. The laird lingered some time, debating the point with the lady. At length, he saw the sloop of war again make her appearance, but, without approaching the shore, she stood away to the westward with all her sail set, and was soon out of sight. The lady's state of timorous and fretful apprehension was so habitual, that her fears went for nothing with her lord and master, but an appearance of disturbance and anxiety among the servants now excited his alarm, especially, when he was called out of the room, and told in private that Mr. Kennedy's horse had come to the stable door alone, with the saddle turned round below its belly, and the reins of the bridle broken, and that a farmer had informed them in passing, that there was a smuggling lugger burning like a furnace on the other side of the point of Warwick, and that, though he had come through the wood, he had seen or heard nothing of Kennedy or the young laird, only there was Dominie Sampson, gone rampaging about, like mad, seeking for them. All was now bustle at Elangoan. The laird and his servants, male and female, hastened to the wood of Warwick. The tenants and cottagers in the neighborhood lent their assistance, partly out of zeal, partly from curiosity. Boats were manned to search the seashore, which, on the other side of the point, rose into high and indented rocks. A vague suspicion was entertained, though too horrible to be expressed, that the child might have fallen from one of these cliffs. The evening had begun to close when the parties entered the wood, and dispersed different ways in quest of the boy and his companion. The darkening of the atmosphere, and the hoarse sighs of the November wind through the naked trees, the rustling of the withered leaves which strewed the glades, the repeated halloos of the different parties, which often drew them together in expectation of meeting the objects of their search, gave a cast of dismal sublimity to the scene. At length, after a minute and fruitless investigation through the wood, the searchers began to draw together into one body, and to compare notes. The agony of the father grew beyond concealment, yet it scarcely equaled the anguish of the tutor. Would to God I had died for him, the affectionate creature repeated, in notes of the deepest distress. Those who were less interested, rushed into a tumultuary discussion of chances and possibilities. Each gave his opinion and each was alternately swayed by that of the others. Some thought the objects of their search had gone aboard the sloop, some that they had gone to a village at three miles' distance, some whispered they might have been on board the lugger, a few planks and beams of which the tide now drifted ashore. At this instant a shout was heard from the beach, so loud, so shrill, so piercing, so different from every sound which the woods that day had rung to, that nobody hesitated a moment to believe that it conveyed tidings, and tidings of dreadful import. All hurried to the place, and, venturing without scruple upon paths, which, at another time, they would have shuddered to lock it, descended towards a cleft of the rock, where one boat's crew was already landed. Here, sirs, here, this way, for God's sake, this way. This way, was the reiterated cry. Elangoan broke through the throng which had already assembled at the fatal spot, and beheld the object of their terror. It was the dead body of Kennedy. At first sight he seemed to have perished by a fall from the rocks, which rose above the spot on which he lay, in a perpendicular precipice of a hundred feet above the beach. The corpse was lying half in, half out of the water, the advancing tide, raising the arm and stirring the clothes, had given it at some distance the appearance of motion, so that those who first discovered the body thought that life remained. But every spark had been long extinguished. My bairn! My bairn! cried the distracted father, where can he be? A dozen mouths were open to communicate hopes which no one felt. Someone at length mentioned the gypsies. In a moment Elangoan had reascended the cliffs, flung himself upon the first horse he met, and rode furiously to the huts at Dernclew. All was there dark and desolate, and, as he dismounted to make more minutes search, he stumbled over fragments of furniture which had been thrown out of the cottages, and the broken wood and thatch which had been pulled down by his orders. At that moment the prophecy, or anathema, of Meg Merrilies fell heavy on his mind. You have stripped the thatch from seven cottages, see that the roof tree of your own house stand the surer. Restore, he cried, restore my bairn. Bring me back my son, and all shall be forgot and forgiven. As he uttered these words in a sort of frenzy, 
his eye caught a glimmering of light in one of the dismantled cottages, it was that in which Meg Merrilies formerly resided. The light, which seemed to proceed from fire, glimmered not only through the window, but also through the rafters of the hut where the roofing had been torn off. He flew to the place, the entrance was bolted despair gave the miserable father the strength of ten men, he rushed against the door with such violence, that it gave way before the momentum of his weight and force. The cottage was empty, but bore marks of recent habitation he flew to the place, the entrance was bolted there was fire on the hearth, a kettle, and some preparation for food. As he eagerly gazed around for something that might confirm his hope that his child yet lived, although in the power of those strange people, a man entered the hut. It was his old gardener. Oh sir, said the old man, such a night as this I trusted never to live to see, ye mon come to the place directly. Is my boy found? Is he alive? Have ye found Harry Bertram? Andrew, have ye found Harry Bertram? No, sir, but. Then he is kidnapped. I am sure of it, Andrew is sure as that I tread upon earth. She has stolen him, and I will never stir from this place till I have tidings of my bairn. Oh, but ye mon come hame, sir. Ye mon come hame, we have sent for the sheriff, and will set a watch here a night, in case the gypsies return, but you ye mon come hame, sir, for my lady's in the death row. Asterisk death agony. Bertram turned a stupefied and unmeaning eye on the messenger who uttered this calamitous news, and, repeating the words, in the death row, as if he could not comprehend their meaning, suffered the old man to drag him towards his horse. During the ride home, he only said, Wife and bairn, baith mother and son, baith sair, sair to abide. It is needless to dwell upon the new scene of agony which awaited him. The news of Kennedy's fate had been eagerly and incautiously communicated at Elangoan, with the gratuitous addition, that, doubtless, he had drawn the young laird over the craig with him, though the tide had swept away the child's body, he was light, poor thing, and would flee farther into the surf. Mrs. Bertram heard the tidings, she was far advanced in her pregnancy, she fell into the pains of premature labor, and, ere Elangoan had recovered his agitated faculties, so as to comprehend the full distress of his situation, he was the father of a female infant, and a widower.